Well, good day, everyone. Um, as we can see, uh, the markets are heading lower. Um, they had a very sloppy, almost wedge-like pattern um, off their lows from August. And uh, so it's not so surprising that uh, the markets are retracing now. Um, as I said earlier uh, in, in the morning's uh, pre-market pulse, wouldn't be surprised if um, they try to uh, retest lows. Uh, this has happened before. Actually, since QE started, it's happened um, pretty much in every case uh, when you get this kind of sloppy upside action um, that the markets then need to unwind that sloppiness somehow. And they did that in uh, 2010 in May after the flash crash. Um, they, did it, they did it again in uh, the second half of 2011 um, with the Greek issues, and uh, they retested uh, more than once. And there was a lot of volatility in there. So um, I'm... Uh, hoping that this is going to be uh, good for the, uh, the volatility model, which is uh, on a sell signal, as well as the market direction model, which is on a sell. Um, the, the MDM did uh, particularly well in 2011 when we had all that volatility um, and was able to, to score some big gains in a very short period of time. Uh, because what happens, interestingly, is when, when the markets, um, we know that the Fed wants to manipulate the markets, and they have done so with QE, but I think when when volatility gets to a certain point, then they can no longer control the markets, and so then um, other forces take over, and therefore the markets become more predictable than normal, even though if you look in 2011, um, mid-2011, for a few months, it looked like a lot of, just a lot of slop, but uh, the MDM did make, uh, I think it was five or six uh, good calls in a row, um, and they were all of appreciable gains. So um, let's see what, uh, what happens this time out. Again, you can't predict these things uh, ahead of time, but um, uh, things are looking interesting. And uh, if we look at um, you know, the, some of these leading stocks, they're, they've been in a, you know, a big rough spot. Um, there, there are very few setups on the long side, um, just a smattering. And you, know, you don't get the leading stocks showing any kind of constructive um, most of these are not showing the kind of constructive action we need to see. Again, the markets, the general markets have wedged higher, and so a lot of these other leading names have done so as well. Their patterns look pretty broken, and a retest of maybe lows or some sort of retest is, uh, is in order here. So that is what we're seeing, um, and that's, in a way, uh, that's all good news. Um, we know that, that uh, the, the global economy is soft. That's why the uh, markets are quite nervous. Um, You'll notice that the NASDAQ went all the way up to, uh, to its 50-day, um, just kissing its 50-day, and then uh, did an about-face, closing um, close to the lows. And then since then, it's um, managed to move lower. Um, the distribution days continue to mount. And uh, the markets are nervous that the Fed did not hike um, rates uh, or also giving indication that the global economy is fragile. So. We know that China's been having problems, um, and that's the second largest economy in the world. So that, um, that creates a lot of nervousness. Uh, we also see that the, um, that the uh, markets are, uh, with, as, as in, re in regard to, to the Fed, we know that they're dovish, and so they are going to probably postpone a rate hike, and, and we've, noted, we've, we've mentioned this in reports a number of times. Um, that we wouldn't be surprised if they're going to postpone till sometime in two, 2016. Uh, the CME Fed Watch futures are tell, are saying that there's only now a 35% chance they believe of a rate hike in December. Um, so that's that's down quite a bit from where it used to be, and uh, that number could move even lower as we get more more news. Um, certainly, if uh, China and of course European countries, etc., should um, head into recession then that is obviously going to put, put off rate hikes um, for as long as, you know, that could, that could put off rate hikes uh, into the end of 2016, a year from now. Um, and, you know, guys like Ray Dalio, who, you know, run, he's, I think he was running the, yeah, he was running the largest bond fund in the world. He, these are guys who, um, who, have, who have made uh, calls on the market that, you know, the Fed hikes, um, the Fed probably is not going to be hiking in earnest for quite some time. Um, so, all that's to be said that uh 
Hmm, did this happen last week? Um, looks like Dr. K dropped out, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, well, you got, I'll, I'll kind of take up the uh, pick up the ball here until Dr. K gets back on. It must be that cheap Can South African. Can you hear me, Gil? Oh, there you are. It must be that cheap South African internet you're using. Yes. So. <laughs> you're kind of coming Yeah, in it's so out. contagious. It affected yours. The I know. Now it's good. <laughs> Anyways, um, so you, where, kind where of, did you, out? you were that, talking that's... about the guy, the fun guy. It's strange because I... that, that's where you dropped out. Yeah. Right? Okay. All right, good. So it only uh, it, it, you guys heard most of what I was saying. Yeah, I was just basically the you know the world's worried about a recession, and the I think that uh, the markets well the markets do telegraph this sort of thing. So if we retest lows um, like we did in 2010, 2011, that, that that might not be where the market stops. We might actually get a proper bona fide bear market of some sort. Um, you know, especially if the recession of some sort. Uh, does come in in China or in Europe, um, and I think that uh, well, Europe Europe's had recessions, and so having an, another recession may not may not be enough to derail the whole market. But if you get that together with China um, and you know basically a global recession at um, right on the horizon, that could uh, create a bona fide bear market that we've been waiting so patiently for um, since all this QE nonsense began, and uh, certainly the Commodities are telegraphing that uh, there is ne not necessarily any sort of meaningful bounce, um, you know, based on the CRB index and, and the price of oil. Uh, everything looks like it's still unraveling and still in a in a downtrend. So, um, you know, these are good indicators to keep an eye on. Um, in general, uh, someone someone was asking about making trades toward the end of the day or at the close because we have all these gap ups and gap downs um, and since China they were saying is is becoming more and more of a wreck um, maybe it, it pays to, to start uh, preempting um, the next day by taking positions at the close well I mean yeah you can, if you have a longer term view that you think everything's going to unravel and you want to take longer positions and you can but keep in mind that we get a, a whole host of gap ups as well in this market environment because it's a news driven environment so you know, this kind of volatility uh, goes both ways, up and down. Um, so if you don't mind stomaching a potential gap up the next day and you want to take a longer term approach, I mean, you're welcome to do that. Um, but again, we I don't know if that's really, a, that's not a method I would try to use um, in this kind of environment. You know, the, the most profitable uh, methods uh, in QE has, have been, especially in the last couple of years, have been to um, buy and short the right stocks and of course we we put out reports on these things and then when you have a profit in the in, in, in a stock in context with this chart then take those profits off the table or at least take half off the table because uh, this is a very difficult environment so you know we've had a, we've had a number of stocks that have given very good profits this year um, despite the treacherousness of this market so you know, and those we've talked about this extensively in our reports. We we sent out some uh, charts, etc., that show you, you know, okay, here's stocks that have gotten ahead of themselves. It's now time to take your profits. Um, we've done that a number of times this year, and um, and and you know, the, those who heeded who heeded that advice hopefully came out with a, a nice profit under their belt um, to offset the uh, the other challenges that this market has laid bare for us. Uh, so. You know, keep on keep on doing that. That that would be my recommendation, as opposed to trying to get cute with the market by taking a position at the close, hoping that the market's going to gap down the next day, because you just don't know. Um, and you can see, you know, just just the nature of the market action in the last few weeks. You know, we've had a number of mar. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the the 8th of September, for instance, that was a huge gap up day, and the market didn't relent and finished. Uh, the Nasdaq was up. Uh, what was it? Almost three percent that day, um, and we've had other days like that. We've had we had uh, the second of September where where the market Nasdaq was up two and a half percent. So it's um, you know I, I we want to put the odds in our favor as much as possible. Um, they, that's that's the upshot here. So I would I would stick to um, doing as as what's worked this year. And um, as far as timing the markets, it's been obviously treacherous because it's been a very sloppy sideways market. 
But like as I said at the beginning of this broadcast, hopefully um, we're going to get more volatility now. And with more volatility can ironically come more predictability because it just means that the Fed perhaps has less control in um, guiding these markets higher. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gil. Okay, I have a couple of things to add to that uh, here, to your discussion. The first is that I don't think the Fed's going to raise rates at all. In fact, I'd be looking for the next round of QE. So I think QE, uh, though, has had very little traction in terms of producing real uh, wealth generation, as you like to discuss, Dr. K, and also real economic growth. I mean, it's such an Orwellian joke to hear Janet Yellen talk about how the economy is improving, but they still have to keep rates at zero, pretty much. And then, of course, there's the other uh, consideration that with the U.S. approaching, or I think, over $19 trillion in debt now, uh, interest, ri interest rates start to rise and what happens to our deficits based on our interest payments. So you know, it's a huge quagmire they've dug themselves into, a big hole they've dug, dug themselves into. I don't think they're ever going to raise Dr. K. I, I think we're going to be like Japan and stay like this for two or three decades. Yeah, yeah, it could happen, absolutely. I mean, the smartest minds have said that they're not going to hike till uh, the end of 2016. And they said this a year ago, and we've talked about this. You know, we've talked about this in our reports, and it sounded a year ago reasonable to me, and I think to you as well, uh, because the Fed's painted themselves in a corner, and uh, it's not something they can just quickly undo. Um, and as Greenspan said, this is unprecedented times, and we have not had this kind of situation. So, you know, what's what's next? <laughs> it's quite right. kind of uh, interesting. It's the age of Orwell, you know, when when Obama can get up there and with a straight face tell everybody that his administration has lowered the deficit more than any other deficit in history, me while he's in the meantime run <laughs> run the total debt from ten trillion to nineteen trillion, it, it's it's really laughable and uh, it's just typical. I mean, even this whole thing with the Pope, you see uh, the government because the Pope has babbled about climate change and income inequality and how. Capitalism is so evil, you know, as if communism is better. You you see all these left-wing politicians grasping onto the Pope, but they still forget the fact that the Pope uh, is also vehemently, and the Catholic Church is vehemently against gay marriage um, and abortion. And uh, so I just think it, it's it's almost like we're in this bizarre era. And then you have Donald Trump in there who, uh, well, I can appreciate the fact that he's uh, touched a nerve among the uh, electorate in that people are really getting fed up with the government, both both sides, Democrats and Republicans. And as a lifelong libertarian, I can say uh, with pride that I've never voted for either a Democrat or a Republican because they're all losers. Um, of course, that's my opinion. You're free to differ with that if you like. But I just think we're in this bizarre uh, period. And and uh, and you get weird characters like Donald Trump pop up, but, but I, I've listened to him speak, and he doesn't really have anything to say really than we're going to be so great, and we're going to make so many great deals, and we're going to be so good, it's, and we're going to be so uh, we're going to we're going to have so many wins that you're going to be tired of winning. It's like okay, put it to me in concrete terms. Uh, and and so it's just we're just in a kind of a bizarre period. It's it's kind of entertaining though. And I should probably say profitable because I'm working on my third year of being up uh, since uh, I stopped bothering with other people's money and just focused on uh, dealing with my own. And uh, most recently, I've been getting short. And I think the, the, the pivotal day, the pivot, pivotal point, if you want to call it that, uh, which is what Livermore referred to, uh, points of... Uh, Reversal in the market, uh, that occurred six days ago on the NASDAQ daily chart here that you can see. And uh, I think we're on that day, and we reversed. We were right into the 50-day, and you're coming up into this area of overhead, see it on this side of the chart here. And so you're getting into this zone of overhead in the 50-day. So that was a logical spot, and it's kind of an ascending wedge. You break the lows of the wedge, and now you're going down. Yesterday, I thought, was just a consolidation day of the prior higher volume uh, gap down on Tuesday. So you had just a little consolidation. You try to move higher, basically stalled out. And now today we're gapping lower. I'm, I'm guessing we're heading for these lows and we're going to test them at least. But what I'm watching for here is stocks that have tried to recover. Because what will happen is if, if we assume or we hypothesize, say, I'm not going to assume anything, to tell you the truth, 
uh, never do because you never know whether um, uh, an initial correction of 10 or 10 or 11 percent or whatever is the start of just a small correction, a deep correction, or a full-blown bear market. You never know. And uh, I discussed this many times. Even Bill O'Neill in June, we talked about this, I think, last week or the week before. In June of 2000, he thought that we were starting a new bull market and that the breakdown from March into June of that year was it. I mean, he didn't, he didn't see the extent of the... Uh, bear market that eventually unfolded over the next couple of years and nobody does and I don't care how great of a guru you think you are how great of a guru you market yourself as nobody knows for sure all you know is what's going on in real time and that's the only thing you can operate uh, on and and so you know we hope what you hope is that you're in the saddle on the short side when we get a huge break I played this pretty nicely I would say one of the differences on the short side for me in this current market, because it's, this year in particular has been very choppy and very bizarre, that there are a lot of sudden moves one way or the other, and you, it's hard to predict. And you can see that you know, the choppiness, it's just been a big sideways choppy range going on for the entire year. And so I, I, I'm unable to, to really get as heavy short or even as heavy long as I might like because there are a lot of surprises in this market. And it's hard to say for sure whether it's more this way than it ever has been. Although, you know, because I can think of uh, prior markets. Like if we go back and look at the NASDAQ, you know what? I'm going to pull out my HGSI here. Bear with me. Uh, I like the new developments in the in HGSI. Actually, I think something that people should uh, look into. I, I'm no longer using WANDA. I think it's, it's really a ripoff, $25,000 a year. Uh, even Market Smith at $1,000 a year seems like a ripoff when you can get this for $600. And, and the new thing that's been added here is, is you can now put in a uh, data window, and I can see the intraday percent volume change. And it's a few minutes delayed, but that's good enough for me. I don't really need things to be all that precise. Uh, just get me into the ballpark so you get a sense of how the volume is moving on, on a particular stock. So if we go to, um, let's see, major market indexes and uh, push down to the NASDAQ composite. Here we go. Okay, now we're going to go back to uh, 2007, which really was the last major market top. So if we want to hypothesize that we are in a major market top, we may be, we may not, then how is it going to play out? And I think, you know, based on history, it's going to fake you out as much as it possibly can. If we look back at the peak, this is a peak in late December, and we've looked at this chart before. And I remember when it broke down, you came down about 11%, 12%, and you, you stopped here at the 200-day, so that was a logical point to bounce. You bounced up towards the 50-day, and then you broke down again. Now, you know, it looked like all hell was going to break loose. It undercuts the 200-day in this prior low, and now we turn back to the upside. And I think there's even, maybe this was a fourth-day follow-through right here. Let me put the uh, crosshairs in. So the fourth-day follow-through day here. And that took you all the way into the 50, and then you rolled over at that point, and you broke down again for the 200-day line. You undercut the 200-day line. So now here we go again. It looks like all hell is going to break loose, and it finds a low along these prior lows. And it rallies back up to the 50-day, and I believe you had a follow-through day here uh, that was big volume, big gap up move, and, and you continue past the 50-day, but you actually find resistance near this high here you don't get past that high and then you break down and now you start the next leg down so I'm sort of looking at the at the action currently and, and seeing how it plays out in this regard because I think if we are in a major market top I think it's more similar because of all the QE and the liquidity sloshing around in the system still because the Fed is still reinvesting the interest they're getting from all these bonds they bought over the last several years uh, I think that you could you're not going to break down like 2000 or even like May 2010. You're going to chop and slop around and screw everybody up. So I think what happens is when you bottom here and you run up, there's long uh, situations. In fact, if you look at Apple, it, it continued higher and made new highs. I think First Solar did. And then they finally rolled over when the market rolled over, I think, in, at this period. So what you'll see is you'll see a whole new wave of, uh, of stocks breaking apart. And that's sort of what I'm watching for here. So we've seen a number of names uh, break down. I'm just going to use this. 
um, like, you know, you've seen software tool works break down and it looks like it's heading for another leg down. So you'll see this, you'll, you'll see these stocks starting to break. You'll see, uh, NXPI is breaking. Um, I think Mobileye is hanging in there and probably is going to become a short. It's hanging along the 200 day. It's probably shortable here. Use a 10 day maybe as a stop, although it is hanging in. I tried to short some the other day at the 10 day line in here somewhere, I think it was. And, uh, I couldn't borrow it, so now it was easy to borrow here and score on this move. Now I can't borrow it, so everybody's short the stock. Uh, Netflix is moving up into the 10-day line. That might put it in a shortable position using the 10-day line uh, as a uh, guide for a stop. Maybe it rallies to the 20-day. If it ran, ran up to the 50-day, I'd probably be all over it, but I can't really consider the conditions under which that would happen if the market's going to continue lower. And, so far, it looks like uh, that's what the market wants to do. So what, what it actually ends up doing is another question altogether. And as I showed from that example in 2007, it can do its best to fake you out and still blow apart. So, you know, you really have to be able to bob and weave with it. I think for most trend-following uh, trend types of investors, I think cash is probably the best place to be right now. I don't really see where the big thematic plays are. I mean, think about it. You can get a good feel for the market's potential based on the stocks that there are to play. Do you see any new companies coming out with compelling themes like Tesla back in, what, what was that, Dr. 2011, 2012, I guess, or, you know, the solars back in early 2007 before the market topped? Do you see anything like that? You don't really. And there's nothing really thematic in the economy just yet. The social networking thing has kind of worked its way out of the system. And so on that basis, I think Netflix, or I'm sorry, LinkedIn is a short, uh, was a short. This morning could have hit it immediately right near the 50-day. I think it's heading back down. You can also see sort of a fractal head and shoulders setting up. So uh, let me take a quick look here. Yeah, you can see this big head and shoulders on the weekly. So do you guys prefer this? I think these are much better charts than uh, e-signals. and probably a little more comprehensive and it's 600 bucks a year versus a thousand for Marcus Smith or 25,000 for Wanda which you know the functionality there you can duplicate a lot of that information uh, there in fact there's very little now on something like Wanda or Marcus Smith that uh, HGSI doesn't have and there's a lot that HGSI has now that those don't have so for my money, and regardless of what the money was, I, I think this is the best tool, and it's been a, a critical uh, part of my uh, performance over the last two and a half years. So, in any case, somebody says, hi, can we please get on with the SM? If I want to hear about the Pope, I will watch on CNN. No, you have to listen to our rants. That's one of the conditions of being on these webinars. So, you know, sorry. But I do think it's relevant in terms of the general uh, and backdrop to what's going on in the world today. And I think it's this applies to the markets as well. You're, you're in this sort of bizarre uh, period where up is down, black is white, you know, just good is bad, bad is good. It's just kind of bizarre. And I think that figures into how strange the market is. So, you know, so too bad. That's all I have to say. Uh, Gil, why are there securities that you can't borrow to short? Are your position sizes too big? I don't know. I'm using Schwab and probably I need to switch brokers so and I bet yeah it does get uh, frustrating somebody says how do you get the intraday box in the upper right hand corner on HCSI to show um, I don't know I just told them to send me uh, I, I guess there was a download that they sent out that, you know call ask them I'm not customer support for HCSI and there was a download that had <clears throat> some built-in chart views with this and all I do is modify it to look the way I want it to look anyways uh, somebody says, I learned so much from your rants. Keep it up. And that comes from Pastor John. So, you know, a religious authority, I'm, I'm going to go with that. Um, I just find that there, there are so many people out there who just find things to get upset about. You know, somebody on Twitter was upset that, uh, you know, I don't really follow Ken Slim anymore. I'm not, I'm not really an O'Neill disciple. I'm an owl disciple. I, I follow more, more of what Wyckoff was teaching and also what Livermore was teaching because Livermore didn't, uh, you'll never read about Livermore talking about five quarters of earnings up. Uh, what he called a pivotal point was really a turning point 
whether that was within an uptrend or, or a reversal of, a, of a, another trend, uptrend or downtrend. Uh, and and not and so Neil took that and turned that into a, a pivot point, which is just basically your mindless crowd following standard issue based breakout. So, and in this market, it doesn't pay to buy base breakouts. Can you discuss distribution dates for the market? I can, but it really doesn't figure into my thinking. I watch the stocks. You know, my, my advice would be to get throw out all these stupid IBD rules. They don't really apply anymore. Yeah, the market's down on heavy volume or higher volume. So what? What are what stocks are you going to play? You know, you get a follow through day. So what? What stocks are you going to play? It it boils down to that. And I've found that by watching the stocks, instead of being a mindless IB dweeb and seeking, you know, black and white answers like, oh, market and follow through, start mindlessly buying stocks or seven distribution days. Uh, you know, market and uptrend, market and downtrend, mar uh, uptrend under pressure, market out to lunch, market on vacation. So it's all BS. And the sooner you figure that out, the better off you're going to be. It boils down to the price volume action of the individual vehicles you're going to play. That would be the stocks. And when you see a follow through day, the healthiest follow throughs will generally occur when you see a lot of names in great positions to buy, where you see a lot of these other things I'm talking about, strong thematic uh uh, backdrops to these stocks, you know, something that can really capture investors' imaginations, and you get a sense of the overall health of a follow-through day or seven or eight distribution days. I've seen markets where you've had 15, 16 distribution days and nothing ever happens. It doesn't go down anymore. So that doesn't tell you anything. Uh, and I think in an era where they can manipulate the indexes a lot more and you have all these ETFs out there that I think also kind of add an interesting flavor to everything as well, uh, you know, I think it's all very unreliable. And, it, and if you're still trapped in IBD land, I think you're just going to get your head handed to you repeatedly. Uh, and that's not to say that the basic principles still don't apply, but I think that they do evolve and they do change. And, and it's all, I think Wyckoff uh, is really the ultimate authority in terms of just understanding price volume action. Uh, you know, and Wyckoff was a big buyer of uh, Lowe's. I had dinner uh, the other day with a, a fellow who's retired now, but he was with a, a big uh, outfit, a big institutional money management firm uh, running $15 billion. They sold out, I think, to PIMCO or somebody, but he's out now and enjoying his life, you know. Um, he still trades. But, you know, he, he told me they always bought at the lows. They didn't buy breakouts. They bought so, – so somebody creates the lows of these bases, you know. Um, and in your grandmother, and it is a bunch of IBD readers because they're all sitting waiting for this to happen so they can buy it and then watch the stock blow to pieces here or buy it here and then watch it come right in on them. My preference is to buy them you know, in here when they're tight along a 10 or 20 day line and their volume is drying up and then you catch a move, you sell into it. So you get a 10% move, boom, you sell into it. Now it's coming in. And if it fails, this could turn into a late stage uh, short or failure. So I'm, I'm watching this action on Facebook, which I think this could be failure prone, and it wouldn't surprise me, you know, you run into some resistance in this area of congestion, and now you're rolling back uh, today, and you, the other thing you'll notice here, you see this greenish line here, uh, it's projecting, based on what it's, the stock's trading today, it's projecting the volume by the close, which I like because I'm visual, it's for me to come over here on the left side and read something is less of the way I operate than visually. And so this is one feature they put on there for me, and I, I really like it. It's available to anybody who uses a system in one of the CAN chart views, so just so you know. Uh, blah, blah, let's see. Somebody says, looking to switch from a manual trading journal to an electronic one. Any idea? I, I don't know. I, I don't use an electronic one. I just will take notes. I'm just kind of old school that way. I keep a little uh, notebook. It's one of those, let's see, it is a uh, Cambridge Limited uh, Quick Notes little notebook. It's like 5 by 7 and I use that to keep my notes in. So it's like my little book I carry with me. Um, yeah, I know, you can use, why not just keep notes in a Word file? When I was at O'Neill, I actually kept a diary all in a Word file, so you could do that. I this other stuff, I don't really know. Which of your books? You can also, uh, Go ahead, Dr. K. You, know, you can also do both. I mean, I have stacks. Yeah, stacks and stacks of charts that I've analyzed over the years. I mean, just, I mean, st I mean, when I say stacks, I mean very tall stacks of thousands of sheets of paper 
over the years, you know, and it's good. Uh, they're all categorized, you know, so like if I want to go into a particular section, um, I can just go right to that folder. Um, but on top of that, I keep a, you know, just a Microsoft Word journal. It's just simple, you know, if yeah, I, that's just to record way, various thoughts, minor notes. So, you know, do both. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there that allow you to do the same thing. So, you know, whatever, whatever. I don't see any advantage one or the other. Whatever works for you. So, uh, let's see. Uh, somebody wants me to comment on RPD. What is RPD? Well, I don't know. What do you want me to tell you? You know, it's it's trying to come up. It's a recent IPO, Rapid Seven. Uh, not making any money, so I don't know. I'm not going to buy it in this environment. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked, which of your books covers voodoo pullbacks in detail? Uh, none of them, actually. <laughs> this is the only place you find out about it. So there's a number of things. I never, ha I haven't discussed 620 charts, which I use for shorting. Uh, I didn't discuss that in the new uh, short selling book because, it, to me, it's just kind of a sideline and not central to the whole strategy of short selling. Voodoo pullbacks are something we talked about here, so you know, we're not not yet uh, ready for general dispensation. So we're not or distribution. So we're you know we're kind of keeping some things for our members and keeping them secret rather than just spewing them all over the place. Someday maybe when we do a second edition of that first book or maybe just an all new book altogether, uh, it might be in there. But I mean, if you think about it, a voodoo pullback is just a Wyckoffian concept, you know. Uh, where you're pulling in and the volume is drawing up. So yeah, that's very Wyckoffian in my view. So I would say, you know, people are asking, what book should I read about chart reading and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I would say read everything you can either by or about Richard Wyckoff, and I would read everything you can either by or about Jesse Livermore. Um, for me, those are the two big sources. That's where O'Neill got all his stuff from. So, you know... Somebody says, uh, speaking of earnings, HGSI, that's the guys who make this, um, did a webinar and showed well-performing stocks, and many of them had minimal to no earnings. Kind of blew that MS earnings stuff out of the water. Yeah, it, to me, you know, maybe back in the 1980s, 1990s, when nobody had access to the data they do today, you know, five quarters of earnings uh, up is, is maybe a great thing because not that many people can see the data. But now everybody knows it. So, and I've talked about this many times before when I was running the institutional business at O'Neill. And around 2001, 2002, a lot of the institutions were more interested in a forward-looking view. So they wanted more estimates. And I think a lot of them do their own homework and trying to figure out where things are going to go rather than where things have been. And I think that's a critical aspect of being successful in the market today. And I think one of the things IBD hasn't adapted to is um, the fact that if five quarters are earnings, a big deal. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. So you're not giving me an advantage over the crowd. So. Uh, let's see. Um, Pandora. Uh, Wyckoff loves this stock. I don't think he would love it here. I'm not sure what you mean there, Rick, but you can maybe elaborate on that. Anyways, um, I, don't know, I think what I'm going to do is go through my uh, short list here. Here's Acuity Brands. You can see this is where it became a short in here. The rally up to the 50-day and rolls over. So that's looking pretty grim. Uh, Amazon. This is one, I think, uh, breaking through the 10-day. This this could be another breakdown to watch, and this is what I'm talking about. If we start another leg down in a bear market, assuming all this is going to play out this way, but again, we don't know ahead of time, so we can only go with what we're seeing in real time. What I would be looking for to key off of would be breakdowns in any of these stocks that have been trying to hold up. So that includes Facebook. That includes Amazon. That's another one. So we'll go through some of these. Uh, Ambrell has already been a short. For a while, Amgen looking like it's going to blow apart here. Uh, I think Apple is going next. Uh, I think it's heading back to, for the 100 level and these lows in here somewhere. Um, and I'm short it, so just so you know, but I short it yesterday when it was up uh, in the right into the 10 day. Avago is probably breaking down again, going through the 200 day. So this becomes shortable. You can use a 50 day here or the 200 day here. 
Baidu is a little extended, but you can see one thing you're starting to see is a lot of these things are, if you consider this a bear flag, I would just take out the capitulation Monday day. I think a lot of this price action down here was all electronically manipulated BS. And I think as a function, I think we talked about this last week or the week before, it's a function of having nothing but computers in there executing orders instead of having humans who, like I said, if you had a crush of selling at the opening, the specialists on the floor would delay the opening. The market makers on the NASDAQ would delay the opening until they could gather up all the orders. And, you know, if you got a bunch of people willing to sell Apple at, say, uh, 100 uh, or 95 or whatever, the specialists would run, go around and try to, to uh, see if there's any bidders they can find to, to open the stock in a more orderly manner. Whereas with electronic, nobody knows what the price is until it starts printing. And so the, the process of price discovery changes in that sense so and I think that's a big factor in this so I'm not I wouldn't really count all of this action so if you think of this as a bear flag and it found resistance at the 20 day which if you read the new short selling book it's very very typical it's broken out to the downside so give me one second you guys I gotta close the door here So that's breaking down. Um, Biogen is, uh, you know, rallies up. If this is bear flag, maybe that's about to break out. It's kind of slightly extended to the down. So here's Biomarin, another one breaking down. CBRE group, this may be shortable using the 20 day or the 10 day as a stop. This is a REIT, I think, and uh, a real estate related. I think it's a REIT. Uh, but I also look at all the REITs. They all look like this. You have a big break and then a bear flag, and now I think you could. If you get another leg down on the market, I think these will break out to the downside. So, sell gene to me is a sure yesterday at the 200 day line. Could have hit it up here at the 50 day, but look at how that's breaking down. And again, a bear flag here, and it looks like it's ready to break out. So, again, if I'm looking for this next leg down to start soon, then what I'm looking for is another wave of breakdowns, both in existing uh, stocks that have already broken down, so my existing short sale targets, and then the stocks that are holding up, because then they'll be the next wave. So think about it in terms of that 2007-2008 example. Apple continued to new highs, and then it broke down in January when the second leg of that bear market started. So that's the sort of clues I'm looking for. And, you know, that's all you're operating with are clues. I think Citrix, there's some talk that yesterday, I actually shorted this yesterday and took a couple points real quick. Uh, there is news on Bloomberg that they're shopping themselves around. We, we are actually using their system, GoToWebinar, uh, which is actually a good system, but I think there's a lot of competition out there, and maybe there's better systems out there. Uh, Dix, this is, here's another one. EA could be failing here. You can see that now dipping below the 50-day. F5, I thought it's a short up in here, and it's been coming down. Facebook, I think it's a one to watch. I'm actually short some. I shorted it the other day. Uh, you can see you have this like uh, pocket pivot maneuver here, but it's extended from the moving averages five, six days ago here. And uh, whoops, here we go right here. This is it. Yeah, five days ago, sorry. And that would have been a pocket pivot if it was close to the 50-day. But this all occurred on quadruple witching. Uh, options expiration. I think a lot of the volume is exaggerated. That was definitely the case with LinkedIn. FireEye, you know, I thought this one might have a chance at bottoming, but look at this was just a bear flag and it's broken out to the downside. So there are some initial clues that we're starting another leg down here. Now it seems a little bit early to me, but it, it doesn't have to play out according to my timeline or even the 2007 2008 timeline. It could come apart a lot faster. And there's just so many bizarre things going on out there uh, that anything could happen. We could just blow apart. You get in this serious uh, break. Google's another one. It's now below the 50-day. So now that could possibly be a short using the 50-day line as a uh, stop. So you can see when you had the gap down on Tuesday, you had a chance to short stuff yesterday into the rally. Uh, but I think a lot of these require being very nimble, and you need to have some experience on the short side. If you're going to start doing it for the first time, I think you should go slow and uh, take your time and, and work small positions and learn. Take a lot of notes. LinkedIn, uh, we talked about that already. MasterCard looks like it's ready to blow. 
you can see how it broke down and has never got above the 50-day, and now it's looking like it wants to blow the 200-day. Uh, I'd like to short onto a you know, into a rally, but you can see volume is probably going to pick up today, not going to be above average based on the current projection, but it looks like it's going to blow. Mobileye, we talked about that. Um, Netflix, probably becoming shortable. Is there, what's the reason why it's up today? That's up. Baidu's up, but Baidu's already been pummeled. I don't know. I mean, almost inclined. I'd keep an eye on uh, Netflix on a 620 chart. It may. Uh, I know I have one hiding in here somewhere. Let's see. Where are you? Well, we can always bring a new one in. New chart. There we go. Make it a little bigger. And go to five minutes. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it's just jetting higher. So one thing I notice here is if you look at the MACD lines, um, let's see if I can catch these just right. They're sort of diminishing in uh, moving the other way as the stock thing goes higher. So you may be getting to a point where it could be shortable on an intraday basis. My guess is you'll have to see the market roll lower, and then this thing will go with it. So does anybody know the news? Uh, on Netflix, do you, Dr. Kang, do you see anything out there? Anyways, I'm going to, uh, somebody asked, where do you go for stock ideas? Go ahead, Dr. K. No, you're talking about news on Netflix? Yeah. That, I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, it's trying to buck the trend, but it, like the volume on it is about average. Yeah, I think it's like a roll. So I'd be watching this for a possible short sale. You know what? Let's, let's just uh, play with this right here. Just tag it. I'm gonna tag. Uh, just to, uh, I'll just put out a thousand here. Fill it 99.80. What do we get filled at? 99.85.02. We'll see. And and why would I do this? Okay. There's a couple things I'm looking at. I'm always watching for extension on an intraday basis. Now all you guys are gonna rush in. Okay. That's good. Push it down for me. But I only shorted a thousand shares. Optimally, I might like to do five. But what I'll do is I'll just put out bits and pieces into a rally, and I'll do it very slow and very small until I get some kind of cushion I can work with. Then I figure out, once I have some cushion, maybe 2%, 3%, where do I want to really lay into this turkey? And uh, and I'm willing to sacrifice that cushion for the sake of being in the saddle when things blow to pieces. But if we look at this, you got the MACD is sort of di diverging, okay? It's had a big move already. The volume is, eh, you know, it looks, on an intraday basis, it looks like you may be running out of buyers, and I'm not sure why anybody would be dumb enough to buy this in this environment, because it looks like, uh, if we look at it over here, you can see that on the weekly over here on the lower right, you can see this sort of uh, head and shoulders forming, and so the 10-week line becomes uh, definitely a short sale point, but it may not get that high, and you can also see it on the daily chart here, the fractal head and shoulders, and this could just be another right shoulder, maybe another blip, and then kiss it off. So, um, but you know, when something's rallying like that, I'll just be tapping it uh, lightly with with a few shares uh, on the way up. Not getting all excited one way or the other, and doing things in a measured, methodical way. If we get a 620 sell, then I can double it up. And as we can see, it's starting to come in. So that's nice. I, I like it when I get some immediate love. So, in a world that is short on love. It's always nice to get love on the short side. You like that? Um, let's see. Stockcharts.com has a free blog about Wyckoff. Yes, I know. I, I subscribe to Stockcharts.com. And you can check that all out. You know, like I said, read everything you can about Wyckoff. So that's another resource. Um, somebody says, I totally agree about Wyckoff being the leading voice on price volume. Works in all markets. IBD works in strong trending bull markets. Just the comment, no stocks and market timing ETS. Totally love how you handle stocks in this market. I prefer e-mini futures for market timing, can manage the overnight moves. Yeah, somebody asking about should they take positions at the end of the day, and you know, all of that in terms of just a black and white rule, I don't think that really works. I think that you are better off playing things uh, based on judgment, based on your cushion. So, let, for example, if I short something you know, like let's say the other day on LinkedIn, if I get uh, 
short the stock on this day here, it looks like it's going to roll over. So I get short stock here and it breaks down. I got three or four bucks on it. I might hold this position overnight, maybe not a huge one. Uh, I don't really operate as big as I used to in the past because of the volatility that you see in the big gaps uh, to either side. And like I said, I don't know if it's unique to this environment because you really you have to go back and, and be there in real time again to really see what the story is. <clears throat> but that's pretty much uh, so okay so we got our Netflix out short we're in a 9980 what is it again 9980 what did I say 87 something like that and uh, it's coming in a little bit so we'll check in on him a little later so we'll go back to uh, our uh, NXP you notice how it's getting some play off the lows because probably you're, you're tagging this low you would not want to short this one you, you needed to be shorting it up here I find shorting is mostly an anticipatory game. If you're trying to react a lot of times in this market, you might get into trouble. Now, Palo Alto Networks is another one of these that was a short sale target. And for all we know, it's forming a head and shoulders. If we look at it uh, on a weekly chart, well, I don't really. Let's go back, back to this chart. Uh, could be a left shoulder, a big head, and now you're forming the right shoulder. And then you're going to see this thing blow back to the downside. And... Uh, don't pay attention to the moving averages because they're for the daily chart. But you're sitting right on the 50-day. So what would be a sign that this thing is breaking down? Obviously, a breakdown through the 50-day. So if you're feeling really, really lucky and you want to anticipate a break here, assuming the market makes lower lows, this, it wouldn't surprise me if this thing rolls over at some point uh, today. And you can see it's kind of compressing here. Volume's been drying up. You're projected to have lighter volume here. Uh, today you can see that little green hopefully you guys can see it little green thing there uh, the bar and uh, it maybe it blows so you could try shorting it here and use a stop at the high of the day I suppose if you wanted to uh, but you know don't short something just because I say so figure it out for yourself be confident in your own decisions I really don't like this idea and I know IBD pushes this idea that everything can be distilled into a, a few basic rules you know investing is as easy as one two three one being pay for our overpriced seminar, two being pay for the next overpriced seminar, and three, pay for the next really overpriced seminar, and then you'll be an expert, and you'll make tons of money, and life will be grand. And that's such a pile of crap. It makes me sick, to tell you the truth. So it's, it's just so much more difficult than that. And my thinking is if I can convey that to people and inspire and encourage people to figure it out themselves and right Dr. K last week we were talking about how we don't use all of our brain power anyways and you know try to use your head you're actually a lot more capable than you think and I think a lot of success uh, a lot of uh, a big part of success rather is is having faith in yourself and in your own abilities so this Netflix is starting to work I should have God why didn't I just put out 5,000 at the time I remember um, I remember uh, back in the day when I was on stage with Bill O'Neill and I remember on one of the one of the uh, presentations, all day presentations we gave, I remember looking around the room and saying to the audience, you know, uh, I think this might have been at the New York one. There, there was a big audience. Uh, there was at least a few hundred people. Uh, it was like seven hundred people. If not several hundred. Yeah. Yeah, close. There's a lot. And, and I remember saying, you know, I look around this at the sea of people, and here's the issue is that only one or two of you may actually learn this material sufficiently well that you can continue to profit off it year in, year out, or let's say cycle after cycle. And uh, my point was that so many people are wedded to their emotions and wedded to their style of doing things um, that it, it, they become stuck in, in a way that's not profitable. So they can sit there all day and, and, and learn what we're saying, but at the end of the day when, when um, the market tests their metal, test, tests their reserve, and it will, uh, a lot of those people are going to go right back to their old habits. That is money losing habits. Um, so you know, like you, basically to underscore your point that this is not an easy thing. If it were easy, you know, it's like brain surgery. You know, people treat this like, you know, um, it's something simple. But you know, you wouldn't ask a brain surgeon, you know, someone who didn't have any any learning in brain surgery to operate on your brain, you know, because obviously it takes years of schooling to get to that level. Um, I would say the markets are at least as difficult as brain surgery. So, yeah, it's, uh, in other words, take, keep your journals and, and annotate your charts and burn the midnight oil and spend a little time every day learning the markets and understanding the cycles, um, you know, and, and of course reading the right books. 
and uh, maybe at some point, you know, you will have a proficiency that uh, will put you in the top 1%, and that means you will be one of those few people who can continue to make money out of the markets, and maybe, you know, if you don't like your job, maybe you actually become a full-time trader. Um, and it, of course, it happens. It, you know, it's, but it, but it's rare. It, just keep in mind, it, it's not a common thing. And the issue with IBD is that they they are a money-making organization. They want to give the impression that it is simpler than it is, because then that's how they get a lot of people to come to their seminars and to buy their papers. Because they give them the wishful thinking that you know, okay, well, I too can make money at this game. Um, and it's not all that difficult, you know, because a lot of people also, they're lazy, you know, inherently lazy, and they're not going to burn the midnight oil for months and months and months. Um, they're, they're going to eventually give up or, you know, the market hits them, you know, clocks them sideways, and they're, you know, that might be enough to, to rattle them out of the markets again. Um, so there's a lot of personal issues that people have to overcome before they can become really proficient at the stuff. I can't hear you, Gil. Oh, there's a book that I mentioned, uh, Trade's About to Happen, uh, and how uh, people like certainty sells, whereas uh, learning to use your judgment doesn't. Uh, I'm just trying to... Uh, Thinking for your, learning to think for yourself is um, <laughs> doesn't sell well because, you know, there, there was a famous uh, philosopher who said something like... Um, uh, I wish uh, I could. I, let, me, let me actually try to find it because it's a great quote. Well, here's a here's a quote. See, uh, he's and the fellow is talking. Uh, David Weiss is his name. He wrote this. I, I think it's a decent book. Everybody should read it. Um, he says uh, Wyckoff wanted to teach students how to develop a trader's feel, intuition. Specificity sells better than intuition. It's more tangible. I believe there is too much dependency on recognizing patterns of behavior rather than on the art of reading bar charts. These patterns can quickly become cookie prints, I would say cookie cutters, like geometric formations into which price movement is stuffed by those looking for a quick no-think fix. They lead to rigid rather than creative thinking. And I think that's very true, and I think it's very true about what IBD right. pitches to people, you know, and yeah. people bite on it, you know, and I understand why. Here's the quote. The, the quote is, um, uh, apparently it was by Sir Joshua Reynolds, um, and he said, there is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the real labor of thinking. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, and I even think when people ask me, you know, please discuss distribution days, it's like, what is there to discuss? A distribution day is pretty straightforward. Index down, volume higher than the prior day. You know, in terms of like, is there a magic number? Uh, no, I think it all depends on what you're seeing in the underlying action based on the individual stocks. And that's where the hard work comes in. Here's a price line. This is another one I'm watching for a breakdown. Uh, Corvo, we, that's breaking down. Let's see, Salesforce might be in a shortable position. You could use the high of the day or the 50-day as a stop. Seagate breaking down, Skyworks continue to break down. There's a few in shortable positions. We already shorted the Netflix, so I'm up a uh, whopping 70 cents on that right now. Um, throw a party. Tesla, again, I'm one to watch for a 50-day breakdown. If you look at the pattern on Tesla, you know, while I'm, I'm doing this, uh, I want to have the moving average here. So we're looking at a weekly chart on Tesla. Feel free to come up anytime. There we go. And you can see you got kind of a double pod. The second pod, it fails here. So it becomes a pod short. Now you've rallied all the way back up to the top of the pod. Now what I would be watching for is usually on the right side of a, of a uh, pod here. And then you might even call this a, another type of a pod because look at how deep this thing is. Um, <clears throat> so a triple pod? Hmm. I don't think I've ever seen that. But um, you're seeing it... Uh, fluttering around the 10 day 20 so if it breaks the 20 day 50 day that's probably a short and it's probably going lower uh, so that's the type of thing I'd want to watch for and it's something I'm I've been watching for uh, and, and like I said I'm short Facebook on that premise we'll see if I'm right Twitter breaking down and rolling over so you're seeing this action of rolling o over and you can see a lot of these patterns are somewhat mature in the sense that they've had a whole month since cap capitulation Monday that's this day on every chart. You can see it on pretty much every chart in the market. 
Uh, these patterns have had some time to work out the last remaining dumb money bids and set up everyone for more downside. So I think, you know, it, it, we're in a position where we can break any at any time. I thought it might take another week or two. Maybe it comes sooner. Maybe it, it comes later. So anyways, um, somebody asked, where do, you, where do you get your ideas from? Well, you know, I'll tell you one of the greatest lists I look at is right here. You go to, uh, there's Morales and Catcher. There's some good lists here. Pocket Pivots, Code Red, Code Blue. You can check all those lists out. I look at IPO lists. They have an IPO list here uh, under HGSI starters. You know, so you go popular stock categories. Uh, where are they? new issues right there so you can go through a whole list of IPOs you know and just scroll through them if you want it's really exciting and uh, and then another one I think this is one of the best lists and because a lot of stocks will show up on this that wouldn't necessarily fit the uh, let's plaster them all over IBD sort of thing uh, stocks and groups moving to the upside and it's in the uh, Woodward and Brown section where they have the canned screens there's all, all kinds of can screens and my my general view is you don't need a specific magic screen I'm just looking uh, using HGSI all I really look at is anything with an ERG rating uh, which is sort of like a comp composite rating uh, on IBD uh, of 150 or more and I just look at all those stocks and I, I look at uh, what's on this particular list and and an IPO list and uh, you know, and then general reading around and looking for new companies or new industries, whatever, and then trying to break it down from there. It requires some elbow grease, but that's part of the fun. It's like a treasure hunt. And, and I think if you're looking for some magic screen or some magic uh, list that I get or, or whatever, you're kind of just being lazy and not understanding that it's not that simple. So. Somebody says, Weiss was at the Golden Gate University Wyckoff Seminar. His presentation was excellent. Somebody asked, do you use sources beyond briefing to get up to speed pre-market? Uh, get up to speed on what, the news? I mean, I, I look at what I do. The first thing I do is I've, I look at all the stocks on my screen, and I can see whether things are gapping up or gapping down. If I see something gapping up or gapping down, sometimes I'll look around for news. You can just do a search on the internet using Google uh, and type in the company name and the stock symbol and you'd be surprised what comes up. It's amazing actually. Uh, but I do take briefing.com because I like the way that the woman uh, on there uh, you know, spews out your symbol when a news uh, item comes out on something that's on your watch list. So that's useful that way. So anyways, um, it's pretty much 9 o'clock straight up so I think we're done here. I want to get back to watching what this market does, but there's a few ideas out there. I don't know, you know, where that whether everything's going to blow apart and we're, we'll be down 500 points by the end of the day, or whether we'll rally back to unchanged. All I know is I'm up reasonably nicely. I have a little cushion this morning uh, based on the short sale stocks or the positions I took overnight, and there's some others I'm looking at. But I'm, you know, you want to be judicious, you want to be methodical, and you want to know where your stops are most of all. So. As far as the long side of this market goes, I don't think it's really there. So not not uh, right now. Anyways, anything else to add, Dr. K? I think we're done. Yeah, we are done. All right. You guys have a uh, great rest of the week, and we'll see what happens today. I, I Like I said, I think you're headed lower. You want to look for short sale ideas maybe we gave you something in Netflix watch these other names that have been holding up because if they start breaking down along with these other names that have already broken down over the last couple of months and are set up say in bear flags like we we're looking at with with names like Twitter Baidu and a bunch of others that are breaking down from bear flags this will tell you that we're starting another wave to the downside and that's all you really need to watch you don't need to count distribution days you don't need IBD to tell you that the market wet its pants or whatever label they're going to put on it. Or um, you, you just need to watch the stocks. It's pretty simple. All right. Anyways, good luck, everyone. Have a great weekend, and we'll catch you next week. So long, everyone.